and welcome to episode 5 of George's Random Astronomical Object. Every episode, I run a random number generator to select random astronomical coordinates in the sky. I then search for an astronomical object near those coordinates and spend a few minutes talking about the object and why it's so interesting to astronomers. So let's run the random number generator. And the random coordinates this week are 13 hours, 46 minutes, 31.7 seconds right ascension, and negative 84 degrees, 24 minutes, 6 seconds declination. This points to a star called R.V. Octantis in the constellation Octans. So before I talk about the star, I'll talk a little bit about the constellation. It was created in the 18th century and was named after a relatively unfamiliar navigational instrument called an octant. It covers the South Celestial Pole. So it's on the opposite side of the celestial sphere from Ursa Minor. However, unlike Ursa Minor, which has some relatively bright stars in a relatively distinct shape, Octans contains relatively faint stars, which don't really seem to form any type of distinct shape whatsoever. And also, while Polaris at the North Celestial Pole is a relatively bright star at the tip of the constellation Ursa Minor, the star located at the South Celestial Pole is almost invisible to the naked eye. Most people wouldn't care about the constellation, except for the fact that it's located over the South Celestial Pole. Now, R.V. Octantis is a type of variable star named an R.R. Lyrae variable after the brightest star that exhibits this type of variation. This class of variable stars are old versions of the stars like the Sun. The Sun is about 5 billion years old, but will continue to fuse hydrogen into helium in its core for another 5 billion years. In RR Lyrae stars, which are more than 10 billion years old, the cores filled up with helium a long time ago, and the stars transformed into red giant stars. After this, the internal pressure got large enough for the helium to fuse into carbon in the star's cores, with hydrogen fusing into helium in shells around this core. The atmospheres of RR Lyrae stars, such as RV Octantis, are unstable in pulse. Typically, the outer atmosphere of one of these stars cools and contracts periodically. But when the atmosphere contracts, the gas increases in temperature and the star gets brighter. This increase in brightness causes the outer atmosphere to heat up and expand, but then after expanding, the atmosphere cools off. The star becomes fainter, the atmosphere contracts, and this cycle repeats itself ad nauseum. The typical pulsation period is between 4 and 20 hours. The stars are all about the same size and have the same luminosities. If astronomers compare the expected luminosity of an RR Lyrae variable to the brightness of the star as measured from Earth, they can determine the distance to the star. These types of stars would actually be excellent for measuring distances to other objects in space, except for the fact that they're relatively faint and hard to detect. Still, they're very good for measuring distances to things like globular clusters. The oldest paper that I could find on R.V. Octantis specifically is a science bulletin entitled Three Poorly Known Variable Stars, written by W. Strohmeyer and H. Ott in 1963. 
It's hard for me to tell whether this was the first time anyone actually photographed R.V. Octantis, or if people actually knew that R.V. Octantis had been around for a while, but this was the first time that anybody had actually seen that its brightness was variable, or if this was the first time anybody bothered to write a paper documenting that the star was variable. The star has a pulsation period of 13 hours and 42 minutes, or about 0.571 days. Its distance has been measured by the Gaia spacecraft as 3,225 light-years, or 989 parsecs. So since this first publication about the star in 1963, R.V. Octantis has been treated as a relatively typical and unexciting R.R. Lyrae variable. However, in 2009, George W. Preston, one of the leading experts on R.R. Lyrae variable stars, reported the presence of helium in 10 of these variable stars as determined by looking at their spectra. And he used R.V. Octantis as the best example of this phenomenon. Like other elements or molecules in space, helium absorbs or emits light at specific wavelengths that appear as lines in spectra. But typically the light is either absorbed or emitted, but not both. In the case of R.V. Octantis, both emission and absorption of light by helium is seen in the star's spectrum. The light absorption comes from gas that is moving slightly relative to the hotter gas that is emitting light. So because of Doppler shifting, the absorption appears at a slightly different wavelength than the emission. This combination of emission and absorption at slightly different wavelengths by a spectral line is referred to as a p Cygni line because such spectral lines were first observed in the spectra of p Cygni although R.V. Octantis is very, very different from P. Cygni, and you shouldn't confuse the two stars. This specific combination of emission and absorption, which appears just before the star becomes brightest in its pulsation period, implies that the gas is shocked in the outer atmosphere of the star as it is contracting. These shocks were expected based on similar observations of hydrogen. However, producing these types of spectral lines typically involves ionizing the gas, and helium requires much more energy than hydrogen to ionize. This observational result has forced astronomers to re-examine their models of how the outer atmospheres of RR Lyrae variable stars work, and specifically has forced astronomers to adjust their models of how shock waves propagate through the outer atmospheres of these stars. So that's a brief description of R.V. Octantis and its 15 minutes of fame. However, this podcast is shorter than 15 minutes, so maybe that's not quite the most accurate description. As I explained earlier, the constellation Octans covers the South Celestial Pole. So, the location on the Earth's surface that corresponds to the position of R.V. Octantis in the sky is located in Antarctica. Very specifically, Marie Birdland, near the Ross Ice Shelf. And while this place right now is very desolate and covered in ice, if we wait a few years with global warming, it will probably be beachfront property. If you liked this episode, you can go to the website for this podcast at www.randomastronomicalobject.com. From the website, you can download episodes of the show, read information about the astronomical objects, and view images of those objects, and send me random feedback. The audio was recorded and edited by George Bendo. The music is Immersion by Sasha Hendy at www.sasha-hendy.de, which is distributed by filmmusic.io under a CC 4.0 attribution license. 
The sound effects are from the Freesound Project at www.freesound.org. Thanks for listening. <laughs> <laughs>